Hey, I'm Nancy Cavey, National ERISA and Individual Disability Attorney. Welcome to Winning Isn't Easy. Before we get started, the Florida Bar says I have to give you a legal disclaimer. This podcast isn't legal advice. So I've said it, but nothing will ever prevent me from giving you an easy to understand overview of the disability insurance world, the games the carriers play, and what you need to know to get the disability benefits you deserve. So off we go. Shoulder disabilities can be extremely uh, difficult to work around, if you will. Um, that's because we use our shoulders uh, in front of us, above us, to the side, and a lack of mobility or stiffness can impact not only the use of that um, particular extremity, the affected extremity, but it also affect the use of both of your shoulders, which is called bilateral manual dexterity. That is really important in an ERISA disability claim. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Specifically, I'm gonna talk about, can you get long-term disability benefits for shoulder problems? Second, I'm gonna tell you the story about how MetLife applied a musculoskeletal and soft tissue disorder limitation to a shoulder surgery case. And I'm also gonna talk to you about how disability carriers will use medical improvement and uh, shoulder injuries or conditions to terminate disability benefits. Ready? Well, I think this is going to be an exciting episode, but let's take a break before we get started, okay? Have you been robbed of your peace of mind from your disability insurance carrier? You owe it to yourself to get a copy of Robbed of Your Peace of Mind, which provides you with everything you need to know about the long-term disability claim process. Request your free copy of the book at kvlaw.com today. Welcome back to Winning Isn't Easy. Can you get long-term disability insurance benefits for shoulder problems? If you have a disability insurance policy or plan through your employer, or you've purchased a disability insurance policy on your own, you might be entitled to your long-term disability benefits because of shoulder problems. But in the course of my practice, I've found that disability carriers or disability plans don't understand the anatomy of the shoulder joint or the types of disabling shoulder problems that can be the basis of a disabled uh, disability claim. So let's talk about those because I want you to be on the same page with me. Let's first talk about the anatomy of the shoulder. Your shoulder joint has three bones. The upper arm is known as the humerus. The shoulder blade is known as the scapula and the collarbone is known as the clavicle. So we've got the basic bone structure here. But I want you to think of your shoulder as a shallow cereal bowl. The top or of the upper arm or the humerus is shaped like a ball. And this humerus is gonna fit into the shallow cereal bowl. It's like a shallow socket, if you will, in the scapula. Now ligaments will keep the ball centered in the socket and your rotator cuff muscles will just do that. They'll lift and they'll rotate your arm. The clavicle, which is across the top of your shoulder, provides support and that allows your arm to move freely. If you've got problems with your shoulder, you might have pain, you might have weakness, you might have instability. And disability carriers don't understand this architecture of the shoulder joint, the shallowness of the joint, and the strong ligaments that are required to keep the ball centered in the socket and then the muscles that allow you to move your arm. What are the common problems with rotator cuffs that disability carriers don't understand? Well, one of the most common problems you'll see with shoulders is rota rotator cuff problems. Um, think about a, a baseball pitcher, that repetitive motion of throwing. That type of motion, or um, which is called repetitive trauma, or actual trauma to the shoulder can cause rotator cuff problems. So let's talk about the anatomy of the rotator cuff and let's talk about what carriers expect to see in your medical records. Now, a lot of people say, why are you going through all this? Because, you know, I just got a rotator cuff problem. Well, the reason is that the disability insurance carrier or plans doctors are going to go through those records. Basic anatomy, the four rotator cuff muscles that move your shoulders um, can um, really impact your ability to use the, the, the shoulder. Um, and the shoulder um, is, uh, as we've talked about before, is in a shallow joint. And the muscles and the tendons help keep the shoulder joint in place. And then the rotator cuff muscles 
will actually move the um, shoulder, let you move it. So one of the most common, well, well, it is a common muscle. One of the integral muscles in the shoulder is the deltoid muscle. And so let's talk about um, some more issues with anatomy and problems that we've got here. Tendonitis is an inflammation of the tendon that connects your shoulder to the upper arm bone. Bursitis is an inflammation of the bursa, which is a fluid filled space in the shoulder. There can also be a partial or a full tear of a tendon. And then there can also be shoulder impingement. That's where the rotator cuff rubs or catches on the bones of the shoulder. Not only that can lead to a tear. So now that we've got some basic anatomy here and we understand some of the basic uh, problems in the shoulder, what is it that the disability carrier is going to do when they look at your medical records? Well, what they're going to be doing is they're going to look for the history of the onset of your symptoms, your symptoms, the results of the x-rays or MRIs, and an arthrogram of your shoulder. They're also going to be looking for x-rays that will show bony injury, bone spurs, or arthritic changes. The MRI is going to show detailed imaging of the tendons, the ligaments, and the muscles that surround the joint. The MRI is also important because it can provide information about the location, size, and age of the rotator cuff tear. An arthrogram, which I've had before, uh, is an injection of dye into the shoulder joint. And it's not a pleasant feeling to have it. But nonetheless, it can reveal hard to find problems in the shoulder, including dislocations or instability. So in all of this, the disability carrier is gonna to wanna to see a diagnosis of the shoulder problems and then a differential diagnosis that rules out other causes of your shoulder symptoms, such as a herniated disc in your neck or even gallbladder disease. Once the diagnosis is established, then the disability carrier is going to look at your records for the treatment and your response to that treatment. The first course of treatment that the carrier is going to expect to see is a recommendation for rest to allow the inflammation or the irritation to subside. But prolonged rest can be bad because it can cause joint stiffness. Now, the disability carrier plan is going to expect that you've undergone a course of physical therapy, medications, including non steroidal anti-inflammatories, and even steroid injections. I have found that many times disability carriers or plans deny claims at this point because they'll argue that the severity of your claimed medical problems, including pain, the limited range of motion, and stiffness, have resolved since your condition wasn't bad enough to have surgery. Okay, but they're gonna flip that argument. If you've undergone shoulder surgery, then the disability carrier plan is gonna closely review your medical records for your post-operative course of treatment and your response. Disability carriers, as I say all the time, aren't in the business of paying benefits. And one of the things they use, one of the tools they use, is a disability duration guideline. And that provides conservative, conservative, conservative estimates of how long it should take for you to recover from your rotator cuff problems. Disability duration guidelines are just that, a guideline uh, because, you know, people are different, but disability carriers absolutely use these as absolutes. Um, so you need to understand that they're going to game disability guides. Now, there are also other problems with the shoulder that can lead to disability claims. One is a frozen shoulder. That's known as adhesive capsulitis. It causes a severe and painful restriction of the motion of the shoulder joint. And I have a lot of disability claims arising out of frozen shoulders. It's a common condition um, that unfortunately impairs your ability to lift and move your arm. It feels like it's like moving through concrete slow-mo. The pain can make getting and staying asleep difficult. So again, we have these issues with um, disability carriers not understanding the anatomy of the shoulder joint, the causes of the frozen shoulder, the symptoms, and the three stages of a frozen shoulder. So what are the causes of a frozen shoulder? It's twice as likely to develop in women than in men, and it commonly occurs in ages 40 to 60 with and without trauma. That confuses disability carriers because they expect to see trauma. It can develop uh, after a shoulder injury, after shoulder surgery, and as a complication of diabetes and even vaccinations. So disability carriers expect some major trauma and they don't understand that there could be minimal trauma or no trauma at all. That's important because then they'll question the diagnosis, but
but then they'll also question the severity of your medical condition because they equate trauma with severity. What are the symptoms that disability carriers miss and things that you need to make sure are in your medical records? Well, if you have problems with the shoulder, they want to uh, have you address whether or not you're having any neck pain issues, upper shoulder pain, elbow and forearm pain, neck stiffness, headaches, and numbness in the hands. Now, again, I don't always see disability carriers considering the advanced stage of uh, symptoms or the impact that those symptoms have on your functionality. So if you have pain or numbness, the disability carrier is going to expect to see that you've undergone an EMG and nerve induction study test to rule out a herniated disc or even carpal tunnel. Um, they get hung up, unfortunately, on the diagnosis. Now, as I indicated to you before, these symptoms can impact bilateral manual dexterity, and that's important to performing most uh, occupations. Carriers don't and plants don't understand the three stages of a frozen shoulder. So let's talk about those and let's talk about what carriers expect to see. In stage one of a frozen shoulder, there's a dull aching pain in the shoulder that can last two to nine months. Over time, the shoulder becomes painful and stiffness will build up, limiting the shoulder movement. At stage two of a frozen shoulder, the pain subsides in the upper arm and the shoulder, but the primary limitation is stiffness and problems with range of motion. And you might have some acute nerve pain uh, when you're moving the shoulder. So you've got to distinguish that um, quote unquote pain from the nerve pain. Pain is one thing, nerve pain is another. And I know that you'd know when you're having nerve pain. But this stage can last four months to a year. Now, during the third stage, there might be a thawing of the shoulder and the range of motion will start to return. This can take two to three years. And the disability carrier in these kinds of cases think that as soon as some degree of range of motion is restored, you're no longer disabled. But these are the kinds of cases I see, and that's the 10% of the cases of frozen shoulders that don't disappear without surgical treatment. Now, the problem here is that the delay or refusal in undergoing surgery can result in permanent damage to the synovial joint, which in turn can result in cartilage destruction and deterioration of the joint with muscle wasting. So, you know, if you are having extensive problems with your shoulder, you want to be seeing a specialist in shoulder disorders, not your garden variety orthopedic surgeon. Once your diagnosis of a frozen shoulder has been established, then the disability carrier is going to uh, go waltzing through your medical records, again, to look at your treatment and your response to treatment. They're going to expect that you have physical therapy, medication, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and injections. And then ultimately, they're going to expect that you see surgery or have surgery. When the, as I look at your medical records, they're going to see whether or not there's any improvement or whether or not you are status quo. Because if you plateau and if you're at status quo, the carrier, again, equates that with an ability to work, which generally is not the case. So your medical records are going to have to make it clear uh, that even with a plateaued status, that you're still having significant dysfunction uh, with your shoulder. Now, another common shoulder condition is shoulder instability and shoulder dislocations. That's generally caused by a traumatic event, can be caused by overuse. Um, and what the carrier is looking for is the instability. And instability is a loosening of a joint. And the shoulder can feel so unstable that it feels like it's going to pop out of the joint. But there's also multidirectional instability, and that can result from chron chronically loose ligaments. It feels like the shoulder isn't staying tightly in position, and there's this excess range of motion. Um, this sensation is known as dead arm. There's also instability. Now, that's commonly seen with people who have loose joints or connective tissue disorder like Ehlers-Danlos. On the other hand, shoulder dislocation is an injury that occurs when the top of the arm bone becomes disconnected from the scapula. So your upper arm bone pops out of the socket. There are three types of shoulder dislocations and carriers don't get this. So your doctor's got to make sure that this is well documented. There's going to be an anterior or forward shoulder dislocation where the head of the humerus 
or the arm is moved forward into the front of the socket known as the glenoid. There's also the posterior or behind, which is where the head of the humerus is moved behind and above the socket. And then there's inferior, where the head of the humerus is moved down and out of the socket. Your medical records should be documenting based on x-rays, MRIs, and physical exam, the nature and the location of the dislocation or the instability. Because again, the disability carrier wants to understand uh, the nature of the, the diagnosis. But they're also going to be looking at those medical records. And I will tell you that um, you know, I'm a big skier and uh, I ski with my one of my friends who is an ER doc. And we've had some of our fellow skiers fall and dislocate the shoulder. And my ER doctor friend pops it back in. That's really called a fresh shoulder dislocation. That obviously is not going to be disabling. And you know, my friends are tough people and we just get up and we keep on skiing. But generally, the, you'll regain full shoulder function within a few weeks. But the problem here is that once you've dislocated the shoulder joint, it can become unstable and prone to repeated dislocations. And if your shoulder dislocates more than once, the surgical repair or tightening of the ligaments is going to be recommended. The rotator cuff, the muscles and the tendons surrounding the shoulder joint are also likely to tear in older patients. And that can make repair and lasting improvement problematic. So if you have um, that kind of a situation where there's been no trauma, um, uh, but you're having continued shoulder problems, again, your doctor needs to document that, why it is you're having these problems and the nature of the problems. Because again, disability carriers are going to be walking through your medical records looking for a reason to deny a claim. Now that I set the stage, now that you're an expert in the anatomy and physiology of, a sh of shoulders, how you uh, understand what diagnostic studies are used, and you understand the different kinds of shoulder conditions. Let's step back for a second, and we're going to talk about real-life cases so you understand how disability carriers handle shoulder claims. Okay, let's take a break before we jump in. <music> 